In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy upon us. I believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not created, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Welcome to the Orthologio Orthodox Apologetics channel. I am your host, Skylar. Uh, you can find me on my blog if you're not aware of what my blog is. My blog is patristicswithjohn.wordpress.com. John is my baptismal name. And so I've got another video in the work for you guys today. I've been uh, inspired to make this by uh, a really a uh, profound verse from the Old Testament, Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13, that St. Cyril Alexandria quoted as I was reading through his Glafric work. Uh, it's a commentary on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament penned by Moses. And I thought, you know, this is really interesting. It, it explicitly identifies God the Son, Jesus Christ, right? The second person of the All Holy and Constantinople Trinity as the fountain of living water, as we also see, as you would also see, as I have seen when I read uh, his aforementioned commentaries on the Twelve Prophets, also by St. Cyril of Alexandria, right? The Son connects us to the well of the Holy Spirit, thereby enabling, enabling baptismal regeneration and sanctification through the Spirit. Jesus Christ is living water. We know God because of the Son, who is the express image of the invisible and ineffable Father and wills to reveal unto us. In fact, he eternally wills to reveal unto us, like the Son is likewise truly a Lord and God. He is eternally a Lord and God. His very body is life itself. He permitted miracles by touch, as we see all throughout the Gospels, and this is something that's picked up in the patristic testimony. And so I thought it would be very helpful to, you know, look out look at the Old Testament, right? Look at the scriptures and draw out the scriptural meaning of Jesus Christ being living water. This is something we see in John 4 and 6 in the New Testament. Uh, this The story of the Samaritan woman is uh, at least alluded to in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, most uh, detailed and vivid account is contained in John 4, 1 to 26, which we're gonna examine at, a little bit later on in this video. After I go through our Old Testament examples of living water in the context of the Old Testament, the appearances of it, what it means, and uh, how this Old Testament prophetic themes, right, in the Old Testament scriptures are being drawn out and fleshed uh, through various scriptural authors. And these are applied by Jesus Christ to himself, as well as uh, the apostles like Paul, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, he applies that Jesus Christ is the rock uh, that followed Israel in the wilderness and provided living water. He actually appeared to Israel and stood on the rock of Horeb, as we'll see in Exodus 17. And uh, yeah, so there's gonna be a lot of Old Testament passages and verses that we're gonna look at. And if you wanna have your Bible handy, and look at look up the references yourself. You're more than welcome to. I'm actually going to have all the references with either Saint Cyril Alexandria's translation or that of the Septuagint right up here on the news on the screen for you guys. For the New Testament, it's going to be the New King James Version translation. And that's enough introductory remarks. Uh, I'm really excited for this video. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's uh, jump in and get started. 
So the first thing we're going to examine is in the book of Genesis, right? Hagar and the angel of the Lord. So this is a passage that we read in Genesis 16, 7 to 14. And we read as follows from the what the prophet Moses wrote. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water, that is Hagar, in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. So we're getting some geographic locational context clues. And then he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord then said to her, Return to your mistress and humble yourself under her hand. Again the angel of the Lord said to her, verse 10, I will surely multiply your seed exceedingly that may not that it may not be counted because of its multitude. And this is a very important verse. That's why I've bolded it for you on the screen. And we read as follows. Once again, the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. For the Lord has taken notice of your humiliation. He shall be a rustic man, and his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then Hagar called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have seen the one who appeared to me face to face. Therefore she called the well, the well of him I saw before me. Observe it between Kadesh and Barad. So we got a little bit to unpack. Some of the patristic testimony is going to be helpful. Uh, St. John of Damascus wrote that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and therefore he is never ignorant of anything. And so he's asking Hagar questions in these opening verses, right? 7 to 10. I'm sorry, 7 to 9. Not because he didn't already know the answer. He knew the answers already. He knew Hagar perfectly. He he knew that she was pregnant, even if she herself didn't necessarily know it. And he already knew the answers, but he's asking for the benefit of Hagar and the faithful who would later read such an account written by Moses so that they would be drawn to the living God, so that they are joined to Yahweh, the all-holy and consubstantial trinity. So what we have here is the angel of the Lord appears to her by a spring of water in the wilderness, right? There are going to see some poetic ties, uh, symbolic meaning in Exodus 17, a spring of water in the wilderness. Why is there going to be a spring of water in the wilderness? Because Jesus Christ is the well of living water. He connects us to the well of the Holy Spirit, thereby enabling baptismal regeneration sanctification through the Spirit. Now, because Jesus Christ is the rock which followed Israel in the desert, the rock which Moses struck and poured forth water for Israel, he is the source of water and life itself, okay? So Jesus is the source of water even in the dry and barren wilderness where there is no food or uh, amenities, essential amenities like food and drink and water, right? You know what I'm saying? So Jesus Christ, right? is the source of food and water, right? The manna and quail from heaven, as well as the water from the rock, as we see in Exodus 17. So he is the source of life. That's what the spring of water here represents. It's the source of life. And who appears to her is the angel of the Lord, that is God the Son, the second person of the all-holy and consubstantial trinity. And she says, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. Okay, the son already knows about this uh, little bit of a spat, little bit of a quarrel with Hagar and her mistress Sarai. He knows all about this. Right? He tells her, well, return to your mistress, humble yourself in her hand, you're her servant. Like, this fight, make peace with her. And he says, you know, this is really important in verse 10, I will surely multiply your seed exceedingly that may not be counted because of its multitude. This clearly indicates the angel of the Lord is God, more specifically God the Son. He says, I will surely multiply your son. Blessings come directly from God. The angel of the Lord says, I, because he is God, the angel of the Lord himself can bless her because the Son is that authority as God. Now, if he were simply an agency argument, a created angelic messenger sent on behalf of the Father, he would have said, the Lord will multiply your seed. But he doesn't say that. He says, I, because the Son has power in and of himself to do such a thing, to bless and multiply him. Right? And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are a shroud, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. The Lord is taking notice of your humiliation. He shall, this, I mean, shows that the Lord. The, the angel of the Lord, the son of God, right? He's on mission because he knows that Hagar is pregnant, even before she knows it. He Not only does he know she's pregnant, she knows it's going to be a boy, it's going to be a male son, right? This is not something you're an, uh, even 
a doctor, right, isn't going to be able to walk up to uh, anybody for that regard, right? Doctor or not, you're not going to be able to walk up to a pregnant woman that you don't even know and be able to tell just by looking at her belly and the state of her gestation period, right? You're not going to know whether it's a male or a a son or a daughter, right? Male or female, unless you have like a sonogram or other evidence to help you aid in that categorization, right? That distinction of whether it's going to be a son or a daughter, right? So Hagar knows, well, look, the angel of the Lord is omniscient. He's clearly not a created angelic messenger. He spoke in the first person as God, not, not, in the third person as one sent by God, but in the first person as God himself. So she knows she's talking to God and she's afraid. She called, Hagar called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. He says, I have seen the one who appeared to me face to face. She saw the son of God, that is God, Yahweh, right? She saw God. And now the thing that we have to keep in mind is when it is said that people have seen God in the Old Testament context, right? When God appears to the prophets, uh, Israel herself, right? The God of whom men saw, or in this case, of whom Hagar saw, is that of God the Son, who is Yahweh, yet not the Father. And again, we see in this final verse, uh, 14, the well of him I saw before me, linking the spring of water, right? the well of eternal life, the well of living water to the sun as the source of living water, the bread of life, thereby uh, showing that the son of God is life itself, life eternal, his very body radiates life, which is going to be drawn out and emphasized in the New Testament canonical gospels, as the Patricia testimony tells us that the Savior permitted miracles by touch to show that his very body radiated life, his very body radiates life, hence he says he is the bread of life and living water, and that we must eat his body and eat his blood and drink his blood in order to uh, confess and profess our faith and be sanctified through the sacramental life of the church, right? Being participated in the sacramental life of the church is an ongoing salvific process, right? And so this is a really profound thing. There's uh, a lot of Old Testament meaning in this video. So that's the first thing we ought to start with Hagar and the angel of the Lord. Mark that down because we're going to Exodus 17 and Moses. So Exodus 17, 5 to 7, uh, I'm going to be quoting from the LXX. Then the Lord said to Moses, go before this people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand the rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it so people may drink. Right? God is literally going to stand on top of the rock. That is God the Son. Moses did so before the children of Israel. Thus he called the name of that place temptation and abuse because of the abusive language of the children of Israel. Because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Right? God the Son is literally there among Israel and Moses. And as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.4, they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that fouled them, and the rock was Christ. So the rock is a type of, of the Son of God, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.4, and also echoed by St. Ambrose of Milan. You know, truly the Lord stood on the rock in Horeb and caused it, to pour forth water when Moses struck it with the rod when he was commanded to. The visible arm of Yahweh is the Son, who is Yahweh, yet not the Father. And so when it is said that God was seen and conversed among men, the God of whom men saw is that of the Son, who is the express image of the invisible and invisible Father. Remember, rocks do not pour forth water by nature, but this is a great miracle and mystery that this very rock did. It remained a rock, yet simultaneously became a fountain of living water in much the same way that the bread and wine are not by nature the body and blood of Christ, but remain bread and wine while simultaneously being the body and blood of Christ, right? How can this be, we say, rather than know, for it suffices for the faithful to trust in the words of the Lord rather than understand the particular nuance of each. Uh, very quickly, the visible arm of the Yahweh is a son. This is something we see in Isaiah, more simply Isaiah 63, 9 to 14. Uh, I'll start in verse 8. He said, Surely my people, my children, have not rejected me. So he became their salvation. 
not an elder or an angel, but the Lord himself saved them from all their tribulation, because he loved them and spared them. He redeemed and took them up and lifted them up all the days of old. Yet they disobeyed him and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he turned against them with hostility and waged war on him. Then he remembered the days of old, he who brought up the shepherd of his sheep from the land, where is he who put his Holy Spirit on him? Where is he who led Moses with his right hand, the arm of his glory, that is the Son of God? He overpowered the water by his presence to make for himself an everlasting name. He brought them through the deep, right? This is a reference to Exodus 14 and 15 with the all-holy and consubstantial trinity parting the Red Sea. He brought them through the deep like a horse through the desert, that they did not grow weary like cattle through the plain. The Spirit came down from the Lord and guided them, the Holy Spirit here. Thus you led your people to make yourself a glorious name, right? We see the all-holy and consubstantial trinity, consubstantial trinity all at work all throughout the Old Testament, right? We see this interconnective interconnectivity, this flowing, this beautiful harmonization, the scripture between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is inspired by one and the same God, one and the same triune God. So we're going to uh, jump ahead to the Minor Prophets and Hosea. Right, so this is also applicable with Isaiah 63, 9 to 14, and so what I was saying, but this also ties into Hosea, and in Hosea 13, 4 to 5, the Septuagint reads, But I am the Lord your God, who makes the heaven firm and creates the earth, whose hands have created the whole host of heaven. But I did not show them to you that you should seek after them. I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, and there is no Savior besides me. I tended you as a shepherd in the wilderness and in an uninhabited land. Okay, so God is the shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Jesus Christ applies this to himself in John 10 in an uninhabited land, the wilderness, right? The wilderness, devoid of uh, essential water and food, barren and dry, and we are uh, given food and water and drink and sus sustainability, sustenance by God himself, that is God the Son. I am the Lord and the God who makes the heaven firm and creates the earth. God is the creator, that's who he is, whose hands, right? The Father is the creator, but whose hands have created the whole house of heaven. The Father alone is not the creator, as if he's a solitary and isolated single hypostasis. But there are three divine hypostases who are constitutional coternal. We see this in Psalm 36. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were established, and all the hosts were them by the breath of his mouth. Recall in the previous side I read for you Isaiah 63, 9 to 14, right? The hands of the Lord are the Holy Spirit and the Son. The Son of God is the right hand of the Lord, the glorious right arm of the Lord. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created the world together. They created all the creation together. They have eternally coexisted, and here is all creation, right? He, the all holy and consubstantial trinity, rescued uh, Egypt from, I'm sorry, rescued Israel from Egypt. More specifically, the Son rescued Israel from Egypt, led them to the Red Sea, where the all holy and consubstantial trinity part of the sea and drowned the Egyptians, right? This is what we see in Exodus 14 and 15. I'm pretty sure I either did a blog post or a video on this. You can look for it on my channel videos, right? And well, look, the Lord is the well of living water that will Never dry up, nor be drained, for there is none who can pluck us from his end. Uh, I must have run in to put never before dry up on this slide. I'm sorry about that. If you noticed that while I was talking, that was just a typo. Type was typing fast, forgot to add it, but I, I digress. So the sun rescued Israel from Egypt, led them to the Red Sea, the all-holy and consubstantial trinity part of the sea, right? The sun went before them, the Father went behind them, the Holy Spirit guiding them always for all holy actions for the actions of the whole holy and consubstantial trinity are from the Father and Son through the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's very exceedingly difficult to speak of them in isolation because of the unity of the Father, Son, and, all, and Holy Spirit, right? And so we see that you shall know no God but me, right? There's still only one God, even though there's three divine hypostases, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's still only one God. There is no Savior besides me, as we see in Isaiah 6, 39 to 14 and elsewhere, right in the Old Testament, literally God himself is going to take on human flesh, be born of us at Theotokos, and carry the cross for our salvation to redeem and betroth men, humanity, to God forever. That's what Jose is talking about, right? So we see all this references to the incarnation, the crucifixion and the resurrection, the passion of Christ, right? We see all these references. We all see references to living water, uh, which we also saw with Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, right? Jesus Christ is the 
well of living water in the wilderness, right? He is in a desolate and barren land. He is always the source of life because he is eternally Lord and God. And uh, this brings us to Amos 8, 11 to 14. So behold, the days will come, says the Lord, that I shall send a a famine across the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but famine to hear the words of the Lord. The waters will be unsettled as far as the sea, and from the north to the east men will scurry about, seeking to find the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And in that day the fair virgins and the strong young men will faint from want of water. Those who swear by the sin offering of Samaria, and who say, O Dan, your God lives, O Bathsheba, your God lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Right, so basically we have the false gods and goddesses, right? They're gonna fall and ever rise again. They're really demons, Psalm 96.5, right? They have no power in and of themselves. They are powerless before the Lord God Almighty, right? They will fall, they will be destroyed, they will never rise again. Only God is eternal, right? God is eternal. Nobody can defeat him. Nobody has power over him, right? And he says the days are going to come where he sends a famine across the land. Not a physical famine, right? Nor a bread, nor a thirst for water, but famine to hear the words of the Lord, right? St. Basil the Great applies such words to Christ, saying that when the people put to death the bread of life, a hunger for the bread came upon them. So Jesus Christ is the bread of life and living water. Without the only begotten, we cannot go God. We cannot know God, and we cannot be connected to the will of the Holy Spirit. Without the sun as our light and shield, we will eternally wander in search of the one true God, and never will we find him unless the sun brings us to the Father. Right? That's very important to keep in mind. The sun brings us to the Father, and the Father brings us to the sun, so that through it all, God is Lord. We also see in Joel... Uh, Joel 2:26 to 27, as well as 3, 1 to 5. I'm going to quote 2:26 to 27. You will eat abundantly and be satisfied and will praise the name of the Lord your God for what he has so wondrously done unto you. And my people will not be put to shame forever. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God and there is no other but me. And at no time will my people be put to shame forever. Uh, this reminded me of John 14, 23. And I'm going to explain why. Jesus answered and said to that, said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. We will be in the presence of God the Son and be eternally satisfied by the bread of life and living water and we will praise the Father for what the Son has done for us and we will know that Jesus Christ is truly God and Lord to the glory of the Father and we will be in his presence for all eternity. Truly the Father sent the Son into the world and the Son brings us to the Father that through it all God is Lord and we come to perfect communion with all holy and consecrated Trinity. Right? So we eat abundantly and be satisfied, right? The sun eternally satisfies our souls with by the bread of life and living water by the body and blood of Christ, right? He brings us to the Father, and we praise the Father for what the Son has done, right? God is worshipped and glorified, okay? But look, and my people will not be put to shame forever, right? The Son is also God to the glory of the Father. We will never be put to shame. He is the chief cornerstone in whom we place our hope and trust. We will know the Lord your God. We will know the Father through the Son. And there is no other God but God. And we will know that the Son is truly Lord and the Father is truly Lord. But there is not then two gods but one. This is the profession of of the faithful, this is what we believe in regards to the Holy Gospel Trinity. This is what the Old Testament and New Testament are teaching, and the harmonization of them with respect to the patristic testimony. Right? There is a bunch of things that we have to keep in mind. We're looking at Christ as living water in the Old Testament. We also see one in Habakkuk. So Habakkuk three. 17 to 19, for though the fig tree will not bear fruit, and there will be no grapes on the vine, the labor of the olive tree fail, and the fields yield no food. Though the sheep have no pasture, and there be no oxen in the cribs, yet I will glory in the Lord, I will rejoice in God my Savior. The Lord is my strength, he will direct my feet to the end, he will set upon me high places, so to conquer by his song. Right, so Amos 8, 11 and chapter 9 tell us that there will be a famine and drought in the land because those who turn to that which is not God to sustain their souls will eternally thirst and hunger and bear no fruit. We are made anew by being joined 
to the well of the Holy Spirit by Jesus Christ, thereby, thereby enabling us to know the all holy and consequential Trinity and be in communion with Him. And so the faithful will glory in the Lord and trust Him always, because those who follow the Son will never be brought to shame. Okay, Joel 2, 26 to 27, we see the interconnectivity, the harmonization of the 12 minor prophets, right? Some of them are writing at different points of time, as we saw in my videos on the 12 minor prophets and St. Cyril Alexander's commentary. They're writing at different times, and yet they all have the same harmonization of the message, which is Christ as living water, that the Son is God, the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but there are not then three gods, but one. They teach and profess and proclaim the all holy and consubstantial trinity from beginning to end. And this brings us to Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13, and St. Cyril Alexandria, I mentioned this way back at the beginning of the video, 25 minutes ago. Well, actually more like 24, because I have my opening prayers when I start my videos, but I digress. Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13 reads, Heaven is astonished at this and exceedingly horrified, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. Right? As we saw in the Minor Prophets, those who reject the sun will eternally wander and thirst and can never know God nor be in communion with him. It is only through the sun that we can know Yahweh. We know Yahweh because of the Son, who is the express image of the invisible and ineffable Father, and eternally wills to reveal the Father to creation, appearing both to the prophets of old and Israel herself, and in these last days God was seen on earth in the flesh, and he must turn to the only begotten, and in him and through him we will live and come to know Yahweh. Right? Heaven is astonished at this and exceedingly horrified, right? The angels are looking in heaven, right? And they're, they, the angels know Jesus is God. They know, believe and confess in the Old Holy and Special Trinity. They praise the Triune God for all eternity. They recognize the Triune God. And so they, uh, my people have committed two evils, right? Some people reject the Trinity, right? And in rejecting the Trinity, you commit two evils. You forsake me, you forsake God, the fountain of living water, right? You reject the Son of God, and so you dig for yourself a broken cistern. You turn to that which is not the one true God to sustain you, and that if you're turning to the source sources other than the one true God to sustain your soul and your spiritual needs of your soul, you're digging for yourself a broken cistern that can hold no water. A cistern is a container, right? It's a basically a gigantic vessel for holding water, and it can hold no water, right? You're saying you're going to eternally thirst and hunger. If you reject the one true God, if you reject God the Son, you're going to eternally wander, you're going to eternally thirst, you're eternally going to hunger. There's going to be no life for you, right? You're going to be cursed to damnation. And so if we want to know Yahweh, we have to turn to the only begotten, right? And in him and through him we will live and come to know God. And this brings us to the Gospel of John and the application of such passages by the New Testament authors, as well as Jesus himself to being the living water. So we see John 4, 1 to 26, okay? This is the passage where Jesus goes to the Samaritan woman at the well. So, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to Samaria, which is called Sychar, named near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. J Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, right? This is a ethnic conflict. The Samaritans, right? They're not fully Jewish, okay? Yes, they, they only accept the Pentateuch. They were originally Jewish by blood, but with the Babylonian captivity, 
right, and displacement, they intermarried with non-Israelites, which for the Jews, this was like a big scandalous thing. So they kind of, well, they didn't kind of, they basically saw the Samaritans as half-bred Jews, not pure Jewish blood, and that they weren't their brothers and sisters in the faith and fellow children of Israel. So Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, Jeremiah 2, 12-13, as we saw with all the other Old Testament references, Jesus is clearly claiming to be living water. So the woman says, you have nothing to draw with, the well is deep, right? You know, because she's thinking physical water, right? Broken cistern that can hold no water. You're eternally going to be trying to draw water. So where do you get this living water? She thinks he's speaking factually, not spiritually. So he directs her to the spiritual. He directs her to God, just as the angel of the Lord, that is God the Son, did to Hagar. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become to him a fountain of water, springing up and everlasting. He speaks not as one sent by God, but as God himself. He speaks as the Lord. But unlike Hagar, the woman doesn't recognize his divinity at this point in time in the conversation. So she's thinking physical water is gonna and confused by it and not sure what's going on but jesus saying i will give him enough for thirst because he connects us to the well of the holy spirit his very body radiates life and she says give me this water that i may not thirst nor come nor come here to draw water again and again and jesus tells her go call your husband and come here the woman answered i have no husband and jesus is omniscient and so he says you have said well i have no husband for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, Well, you had knowledge of my personal uh, marital affairs and status. So she begins to perceive that he is a prophet. But he's not just a prophet, he is the Messiah, the divine Son of God. He is God in the flesh. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in jerusalem worship the father right he's directing her to the spiritual you worship what you do not know we worship what we worship for salvation is of the jews but the hour is coming and now it is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such to worship him god is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth the woman said to him i know that the messiah is coming it was called christ when he comes he will tell us all things jesus said to him i who speak to you he he claims to be the messiah right so as saint cyril alexandria commentates on this jesus is leading her from generalities to particulars right if you reject the son you have a general conception of who god is you can know about god but you don't actually know god personally if you want a personal intimate relationship perfect communion with God, you have to turn to the only begotten. The Son brings us to the Father, and the Father brings us to the Son. We worship Him in spirit and truth. We turn to the spiritual because we recognize the all holy and consequential Trinity. And this is actually brought up in Isaiah 12. And in that day, you will say, I will bless you, O Lord, although you were angry with me. You turned away your anger and had mercy on me. Behold, God is my Savior and Lord. I will trust in him and be saved by him. I will not be afraid, for the Lord is my glory and my praise. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with gladness from the wells of salvation. In that day you shall say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his glorious things among the Gentiles, and make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the name of the Lord, for he has done great things. Declare this in all the earth. Exalt and be glad, O inhabitants of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is exalted in our midst. The Holy One of Israel is Jesus Christ. He came down from heaven to dwell in the midst of Zion, Jerusalem. Right? Uh, you will draw water with gladness from the wells of salvation. We gladly partake of the body and blood of Christ for those who have been baptized, right? We gladly partake of it. And in doing so, we enable baptismal regeneration, sanctification through the Spirit by participating in the sacramental life of the Church. And so we see Jesus say, 
from the wells of salvation, Jesus is living water, in contrast to Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13, when we turn away from the only begotten, we're looking at broken cisterns as our source of water. We're not going to the well of the Holy Spirit, the well of living water, right? So we're not going to have baptismal regeneration. We don't have sanctification through the Holy Spirit. We don't have communion with the all holy and constitutional trinity unless we are connected to the Son of God who brings us to the Father. Right? And this is all important. This is why I mentioned all these Old Testament passages, because they all tie on perfectly with John. And then later we see John 6, 43 to 59, right? This is the bread of heaven. I'm sorry, bread of heaven, bread of life, uh, living water, right? Eat his body, eat his flesh, as the Orthodox Study Bible uh, subtitles this passage from John. And, uh, yeah, so Jesus said to him, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws near him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus is God. He is sent by the Father. He will raise us up on the last day. He is the author of life and death, the source of life everlasting. He is the judge of the living and the dead. Therefore, everyone who has heard him learn from the Father comes to me. If you want to know God, you turn to the only begotten, nor that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. So Jesus clearly saying, I am God, I alone have seen the Father and the Holy Spirit too, because the Holy Spirit, is, Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God and is omniscient and consubstantial to the Father, right? But I digress. Uh, he who is from God, Jesus came down from heaven to earth, the incarnation. He has seen Father. Jesus has seen the Father because he is God. Those who have seen the Son have seen the Father, as he tells us in John 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, if we believe in the only begotten, we have eternal life. He is the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. I am the bread which came down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. I am the and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Speaking of the crucifixion, the passion, the last supper, right? Jesus is the bread of life, life eternal. He's also living water. The Jews don't understand it because like the Samaritan, they're focused on the factual and not the spiritual. They, they're they blinded to the truth of the all holy and constitutional trinity. Again, not everybody recognizes the trinity. That's the case even today. And if you don't recognize the Trinity, well, you don't have eternal life. You're going to eternally thirst and wander. You're never going to know God. You can know about God, but you will never know God personally and have a perfect and intimate relationship with the all-holy and consubstantial Trinity. So you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you drink his blood, and you have life. Right? We have eternal life by doing this. The Son will raise us up on the last day. His flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. That is what the Son Jesus Christ says. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him, as the living Father sent me, because the Son is sent by the Father. Uh, we partake of the sacramental life of the Church, the Eucharist, right? The body and blood of Christ. And this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your Father ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Right, as I said earlier on Exodus 17, right, rocks do not pour forth water by nature, right, uh, body, bread, and water, they sustain creation for a time, but it is a great miracle and mystery that the rock poured forth water in the same way as the mystery, but understood by the faithful, that the bread and wine while simultaneously being bread and wine and are not by nature the body and blood of Christ, are simultaneously uh, changed into the body and blood of Christ in the observation of the Lord's Supper in, in Holy Communion. And how this can be, we say rather than know, but we know it is true. We know it is literally the body and blood of Christ. And that is why only those who have been baptized and uh, are part of the church participate in communion, right? If you're a catechumen or an inquirer, or you were a Protestant visiting an Orthodox church, you would not participate in communion with the rest of the faithful. It is only those uh, members of the Orthodox church in good sacramental standing. So that's what I have for you uh, is Christ as living water, the 
scriptural meaning of Jesus Christ being living water. We saw in the Old Testament all these passages are a lot more I could have mentioned, but it's really picked up in John, emphasized by the Apostle Paul, and elsewhere in the New Testament and in the Prophetic Testimony. And we really just see the overall arching thing. And just uh, really quickly, First John 6, uh, you, St. Cyril Alexandria says the Son is life by nature, right? He is eternally Lord and God. He is life itself, right? The Son brings us to the Father and the Father brings us to the Son. We turn to the only begotten and live. You, we believe in and confess the all-holy and constant Son of Trinity. And that is our hope and that is the truth. We hope in the all-holy and consequential eternity. We have faith that God will save us. The triune God is the one true God. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, who are consubstantial and co-eternal. I strongly encourage you to look at these passages in greater detail, even find some more ones that I did mention. Spoiler alert, there are other uh, verses, passages from the Old Testament I could have mentioned, but for the sake of time, I just used a selection of the copious examples from the Old Testament scriptures. Right, I hope you found this video beneficial and helpful. As always, thanks for watching my videos. Feel free to check out my blog, picture6withjohn.wordpress.com. Thanks for watching, have a great day, and God bless.